All right, Lusketeers, welcome back to the podcast. My name is Levi. My name is Jenny. You know us. <laughs> <laughs> one of these days, you're going to give me a straight read on that one, and I'm going to fall out of my chair. Okay. Because I'm not. Ex- I'm not going to ready for it. You know. Heard. <laughs> How you know us, <laughs> she says. Devious, devious Jenny. Uh, we are so glad to welcome you back to this spring edition of Hey, It's the Lust Goes. Uh, as it we is are spring. just moving our way, are moving our merry little way through May. Mm. And what a wonderful month May is. The, the unsung hero, because everyone's chomping at the bit to get to June. May just is a wonderful month. Enjoy the May showers. It wasn't it's it April showers? April May showers flowers. bring May flowers. But, um, but maybe your you're birthday getting is, in May too. Your birthday month is May. I love May. And um, it's a May great month. May the 4th be with you. May the 4th. Fourth. Fourth, fourth be with you is this month. We got Cinco de Mayo. We got Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. It's a big month for holidays. We got a lot of graduation energy towards yeah. the end of May. Um, we are, uh, before we get into this episode, uh, which is powerful, let me just say from the beginning, I promise you, if you make it to the end of this episode, you're going to pull something out that, yes. can, that can help you. Yes. Or someone in your life who's struggling. Mm-hmm. Because we are, and it's an intense episode. You know, if you got kids in the car, if you got, you know, little ones listening, this is intense. You know, um, our guest has a very intense story that involves a home invasion, uh, that involves murder, that involves a lot of hard things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're talking about gunshot wounds and different things. So just so you know, that we're, we're going to go. Yeah. But with grace, with light, beautiful. not sensational or macabre, yeah. but it is, it is real. And, um, you know, that, that, but, but he, with healing and redemption and with poise and, um, grace and lightness. And I, I, I've known Davey for a long time. Our guest today is Davey Blackburn, the author of the new book, Nothing is Wasted, that comes out this July. It's out for pre-order now. We talk about that towards the very end of the conversation, but, um, I've known him and tracked with him because I was just heartbroken as the world was when this all took place and was watching, him him struggled to find you know how god was going to use him and uh and we were real encouraged we had him come out and preach at our church and it it was really beautiful and so just now we we've kind of lost touch in, in as time's gone on but coming back in into dialoguing with him it, there's so clear that there's been such a powerful work of healing yeah and uh it's real sweet to to see him steward well yeah. what he's carrying and faced with and definitely don't yeah. you think no for sure and um yeah i agree with that and just how he um just has the word the 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 word just comes out of his mouth and he just mm-hmm. knows um what he's talking about when it comes to in psychology and, and you know lots of lots of good things very very good great so great ministry um and even if you have a church like just a great opportunity to have um him come and mm-hmm. serve your church. Very good. Uh, before we go any further, though, we do want to mention, uh, if you're new to this, hello, hi, we're glad you're here. Hi, we're welcome. The you belong here. You belong here. This is on our <laughs> preaching podcast. This is where we have fun, bring friends on, take topics on, and take Laugh. questions on. Uh, Jenny and I are really excited about that. We talk parenting, marriage, life. The podcast is is, is fun for us. Uh, and it's whether we get out on the town every week, a free date night for us here. We get it. We get it. We know we're going to have an hour together in the studio. Yeah. And we love it. We love each other. We and do. we love you. We love our Aww. Lusketeers. And yes. we want you to know that we are still just shy. Like we just tallied the beep, boop, pop, beep, boop, pop, whoop. Uh, we <laughs> promised that we would send you for free a Hey, so let's go sicker. Yeah. Up to 2 million. And we're, sh- we're still shy of that 2 million mark. <laughs> no, it's closing in. <laughs> but if you send a self addressed stamped envelope, that's S. A I S envelope self addressed. Oh, dang it. What is the I? Self addressed stamped. E S A S E. Oh, sassy. Okay. Sassy. Sassy. S A S E. Self addressed stamped envelope to us uh, on the address that you can find uh, on our website. <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, we'll send you a Hey, so let's go sticker We're for We're not making free. it that easy for you. Sorry. Yeah, no, you have to buy a stamp. You have to buy an envelope. You have to address it. You have to Do put it inside a bigger envelope. Yep. That's made out to us with an address that I'm not even going to give you. You have to go find it. And so many I don't of you have know written notes along with your envelope. And Everyone that's gone out, we've been and blessed And just encouraging. By. And so, you know. Yeah. So, so get an envelope, put it in another envelope with stamps, addresses, and we'll send you a sticker for free. You can put it on your water bottle or yeah. your 
Trapper Keeper. Maybe we'll send you two. Woo, woo. One to keep and one to give. There are cartoon versions of us child. holding a flag that says Lusketeer. To your dog. So that's what, ha- that's what happens. That's what you get. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, we also still have spaces for you and your family. I think. I'm saying this now in faith. For, on the Incomparable Cruise, Jenny and I are going to be leading a cruise through the Mediterranean along with Lisa Harper and Cody Carnes and Carrie Harry Job. Job. What a blessing that's going to be. What firm foundation we're going to be standing on. <laughs> he won't. Uh, firm so, foundation on a boat. Christ is our firm foundation. I love that song. Me too. Mm. And then Lisa teaching, us teaching through the Mediterranean. You can get information for that at Um, But without further ado, Jenny Lesko, we hope you enjoy this conversation with Davey Blackburn. <laughs> Well, Davey Blackburn, we're so glad to have you on the podcast. Thanks for coming out today. Yeah, it's great to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Bro, what a good deep voice you have. <laughs> right? Better to speak to you with. The better to eat you with? Are you, did, were you going like Goldilocks? <laughs> yeah. Wait, was that that? The bear, the, yeah, the better to eat you. What is that from? Better to, oh. Yeah. <laughs> better to see uh, you with. Better to see you hood. with. Red to, Riding Hood. Red Riding Hood. <laughs> you, are you saying he's like a wolf? <laughs> These things a predator. Better to eat you, my dear. I was saying you have a sultry <laughs> FM DJ. Totally. You know, that's that's funny. I've heard that before too, and it's the complete opposite. People say your preaching voice is so different than your podcast voice. I'm like, well, I think I, I think I like the podcast side of things a lot better. <laughs> it's a lot less stressful, that's for sure. Oh yeah, that's, that's yes. very true. And you're yes, you're right Lord. up on the mic. You're not dealing with the the room that's dynamics, right. the headset, and the, even the the flutters and the. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't get nearly as fluttery to a everything. podcast as a sermon. That's right. Yeah, you don't have to drive the whole thing. You just kind of go with the flow. And there's not yeah. the emotional crash on the back end. <sighs> Ooh, tell me about it. You know? So true. Uh, yeah, so Davey, talking about that, you transitioned out of your church, uh, which you planted yeah. in Indianapolis. Uh, what was the name of the church? Resonate Church. Resonate, Resonate that's Church. Right. What year did you Resonate transition church. out? 2019. <clears throat> so I got lucky. remarried in 2017. <laughs> Wait, Jenny just said I lucky. Say on this. <laughs> I'm just, totally joking. Jenny just longingly said <laughs> lucky. So you know why? It's a Monday after church. It's a Monday. <laughs> We've just been in meetings all no, morning. Oh, I love our church. I'm just saying that 2019, that was the year to get out. <laughs> yeah, that that was like a good time. You were saying right he there. didn't go through the pandemic. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, you were on it on your cho- yeah. Bye, guys. You knew. See you yeah. later. The Holy Spirit yeah. spoke to you. The Sorry. Lord knew that. We one have a whole separate conversation we need to have about <laughs> unity in ministry <laughs> now, Davy. I love the church. <laughs> I do too. Uh, <laughs> okay, so nineteen. Okay, now that we've cleared you that and your up. wife, Christy. Yeah. yeah, my wife and I, Christy, we got married in seventeen. Blended our families. Pastored the church for a year together, and then at the end of eighteen, we just felt this really clear burden and calling that it was our time to step away mm. and to help the big C church as they're, especially churches as they're helping people heal from trauma, tragedy, major life transition. So we didn't really know what that meant because all we had was a podcast. We had a podcast called Nothing Is Wasted Podcast. And we felt like the Lord said, okay, step out and just help people heal. And so it was just a big faith step, mm. but it's turned now to a full-fledged ministry where we have coaching. We have 30 plus coaches all around the country that help people. Wow. Grin. Dozens of churches with a curriculum called Pain to Purpose, and I spend most of my time now serving pastors, getting to fill in, you know, and speaking with, and and I love that side of things. Let me tell you right now, that is, it's a lot, for me, it's a lot more fulfilling. I think it's just how I'm wired to just stand in the gap for pastors as they're trying to catch a breath and maybe to help support and serve them in some, in some areas of their church where they may feel like that they have a, uh, you know, a, a vacuum or a hole. So it's been really really fulfilling and meaningful. Wow. Yeah. And you know, you come in as a guest speaker, you do your thing, you're new to everybody. They've not heard your jokes. And <laughs> it's right. like, bye bye. Send it's all easier, angry truthfully. emails to pastor at church dot not me. You know? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> no, that's, my, that's a fantasy of mine. That's just. No. Yeah. Well, you're, you're dead on man. Like being a senior pastor is a weight that 
people, most people are not going to understand. Mm -hmm. And so having been that and having been in the church planting space, you know, it's really nice to be able to sit on the other side of the table and be able to say, hey, I understand. I get where you're coming from and let me help in any way that I can. Yeah. And just to provide that kind of support, it, it really is fulfilling. But you're right. I don't think anybody's going to understand the weight unless they've done it, the weight that a senior pastor carries. But to your point, you know, you're uniquely suited mm. for having the right mind to come in and serve the house. Yeah. You know, because you can always tell like when someone who preaches a great sermon, but it's not like lived experience. You know, right. I, I even have friends who have come to, you know, speak at our church maybe after a very long itinerant season or only itinerant mm -hmm. season versus then they plant a church and get a few years of yes. getting their, 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 their soul seasoned through the rigors yeah. of that kind of ministry, which is just, it is a very different ministry than, right. you know, anything else. And then <laughs> have them come back in. It's like, oh, you have, you are always gifted. You're always anointed, but there is a different level that you appreciate it more where it's like, hey, that might preach well, but it's not going to live well. Mm -hmm. You know, where every sermon's about get out of the boat, get out of the boat. So it's like, dude, what do you want everyone to quit their job tomorrow? You know what I mean? It's like sometimes yeah, exactly. Jesus calls us to stay. There were 11 disciples right. who stayed in the boat, you know? Yeah, that's good. And the that's guest speaker good. doesn't always appreciate the nuances of living right. with people long-term year mm. in and year out, right? So you're yeah, kind of perfectly, so I've been there. I understand that. I yeah. know what helps the church, what doesn't. And then to come in and serve the pastors is really smart. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting you say that. I think that, you know, God works in seasons. And I think for a while I felt almost, you know, I don't know. I felt almost like a, like I wasn't stepping, I wasn't, I had an identity crisis when I stepped away from being a pastor. Mm -hmm. Because for the longest time I thought that the only thing I could do in ministry was be a pastor of a local church. That's just how I cut my teeth in ministry. That's exact. So that was the vein that I was thinking through. But you see that God uses all of your past, all of your personality, all of your, your pain. And you guys know this well to leverage whatever that redemptive future is that he has for you. And you begin to see all those things converge to uniquely place you into the season and the assignment that he has for you in the next season. So I'm definitely, I'm feeling that and living that out right now. Yeah. Mm. Wow. And are you, the churches you go to, like, are you in residence where you come to a certain number of churches every year or do you have a few churches you come to multiple times or is it all kind of more, more random than that? It's mixed up. So a lot of times we're launching our curriculum in a church. So we give them kind of a big springboard weekend. And our curriculum is called Pain to Purpose. So it's meant to be in discipleship programs. So whether they're doing small groups or whether they do class class settings, but we like to think of it as like the the Financial Peace University of Pain and Trauma, you know, if you're familiar mm. with Dave Ramsey's FPU. And so it functions very similar to that. But what I do is I come give it breath, give it a springboard, do a whole weekend packaged around it to give them the, the greatest launch into that. So in that case, it's, it's usually a different church every weekend, but we do have about five or six churches that we kind of serve regularly a few times a year just to provide support. Yeah, wow. And, wow. and the curriculum itself how many weeks long does that course run? Pain to yeah, we usually try to get, we, it's, there's a 12-week option and an eight-week option, and it depends. We try to stay adaptable to however the church normally runs there, especially their small group rhythms. Mm. And so a lot of churches do the spring, fall, 13-week kind of thing. So it slots into that really well. And then they could slot it into that eight-week summer too. So that's really how it's, how it's built to function. Wow. Man, that's fantastic. Wow. Um, what, talk to me more though about that identity challenge, leaving the church, like, cause you planted Resonate Church. So right, right. stepping out of that must've been pretty excruciating, mm. I would think. It was absolutely excruciating. You know, I mean, obviously many of your listeners or viewers may or may not know my story. My first excruciting loss was the loss of my wife in 2015. Yeah, yeah. we'll definitely talk um, about And our unborn Amanda, baby yeah. when she was, when she was murdered in our home. But because she and I planted that church together and there was so much about the mission of the church on, in the aftermath of that, that was, we're going to redeem this. We're going to leverage what has happened to her for purpose to reach this city. It became so fused to who I was. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a temptation anyways for a lot of pastors right. that their ministry becomes their identity and they're not sure who they are as a son or a daughter of God outside yeah. of their ministry. But for me, especially after having to answer the call to step away from that, it was like I lost another baby. 
And, and it was just, it was excruciating. It, it sent me into a little bit of a, like I said, an identity crisis. I didn't really have like the time or bandwidth because here I was now trying to figure out how to make a living for my family on the, I'm going, what do I do? But I could see that it, there was a residual effect of that for, for quite some time because I was so, my identity was so fused to what I did. How did you know that God wanted you to step out of the pulpit and step out of the church? Like what? <clears throat> that's, that's a great question. Yeah. So I always go back to, like, you know, Henry Blackerby's experiencing God and he talks about how to hear from God. And there's, you know, usually four kind of ways that you, and, and it usually works linearly that God speaks to us. He speaks to us through his word. You're never going to know his, his will outside of his word. Yeah. He's not going to speak contrary to his word. He's spoken so much in his word that we can glean from, but he will also speak in season and in the moment exactly what you are needing if you're posturing yourself to listen to him. A lot of times people are like, why isn't God speaking? Why isn't God speaking? Well, no, he's speaking. We're just not posturing ourselves. We're not pausing to listen to him. And we've, we've just got so much distraction. People are like, well, I want to hear the audible voice of God. That'd be so much easier. Well, yeah, take your Bible, read it out loud. There's the <laughs> audible voice of God. That's good. And so he speaks through his word. Then he speaks through the Holy Spirit, illuminating his word. And then he usual, he'll speak through circumstances that are going on in your life as you're following, right? It says in scripture that man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. So he closes doors, open, opens doors. And then the fourth thing is he speaks through other godly mentors and authority around your life. And so for us, it was passed through the filter of those four things. And so back in 2000. 10, 2011, when I was on staff at a church in South Carolina and God spoke to my late wife and I over the course of eight months to go plant a church, we saw it happen through that same filtration system. And the same filtration system took place in our life, Christy and I, as we were listening to the Lord on what's next for us, what, what season do you have for us? Is it to stay here? And we thought we would pastor that church for the rest of our lives. Mm. We thought we'd baptize our kids in that church. And so because that was our ambition and our aim, it became even more difficult to kind of cut through all of that fleshly desire to respond to God. But that's, those are the ways that he made it really clear. And I can tell you story after story after story, like this thing popping out in the word and mm. this person coming in. And we had a board member who came and said, Hey, I just really feel like God's shifting things for you guys. And we're like, wait, what? And then my executive pastor was like, Hey man, I think God's got Nothing is wasted all over your life to do full time. And we're going, what is, and like, I'm not hearing it. And God's going, yeah, I'm trying to tell you, well, <laughs> but you're not listening. Wow. You know? wow. Now, did you sense it first or Christy, or was it kind of a mutual timeline on that? Well, um, I think, I think we both sensed together this, something is unsettling right now. And a lot of times God will use that for transitions. There'll be like an unsettling. So sometimes people get really frustrated when relationships kind of get a little bit unsettled or they get, you know, and it's like, well, it might not all be pejorative in this situation. It may be that God is just shifting things. Yeah. And so we couldn't place what that was. So our natural inclination was, well, let's just double down, right? Let's just, it must be something wrong. So that's why we're going to fix everything. That's why it's unsettling. And over the course of time, again, some of these mentors speaking to my life, I had one mentor who said, hey, Davey, the grace has shifted on you. Oh, wow. And I had never heard that phrase before. Mm. And it really brought some language because what I felt like is every, all the effort that I would put in personally to the church would just, it would just fizzle out. It's like God's breath and his grace wasn't on that anymore. But any tiny bit of effort that I would put toward nothing is wasted. It's just flourished. Hmm. And it was like, I was running with my, my, the wind at my back and I couldn't, I couldn't understand it until I had some of the right plans fail for lack of counsel with many advisors, they succeed. And so you've got to have some of those godly spiritual directors around you going, Hey, here's what I'm seeing in your life right now. And this is going to help you as you move into your next phase of convergence, the next assignment. And she was at a real similar kind of awareness of yeah. that. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah. So we actually spent some time praying together about that, praying separately and fasting and then coming back going, what did God speak to you about? And then she got to the place where she recognized it earlier than I did. Hmm. But of course she was very sensitive to the fact that, Hey, you know, you've been in this much longer than I have. And so, you know, she was, she was, she was in it 
completely with me going, Hey, let's, let's do this thing. Let's, but I think she could see from afar, like something's shifting here. I don't know what's going on. She's got this just real keen sense of discernment as most of our spouses do, right? Levi, and we just Mm -hmm. start to lean in and go, okay, yeah, this is what God's, what God's starting to do in our lives. Yeah. So what about the actual transition itself? Um, you know, looking back on it now that that's, uh, uh, that happened, what, what was the process like of the church finding your replacement, you know, yeah. the, the quote unquote kind of lame duck pe- period and then yeah. life after the pastor of the church. And you don't, do you still live in the same city? Still live in Indianapolis. Yep. Still live in the same city. Are you city. a part of the church? So we ended up closing the church. Oh, it's closed. Oh. Okay. So that's a different kind of transition. It. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very, and that was, we tried to do, tried to do anything but that. Mm. What we found, especially with the nature of our story, is that the church infrastructure, leadership, everything had just gotten inextricably fused to the story and to me that our board of advisors thought it would be best if we said, Hey, this is, this church has had its season where it was ripe and its purpose in this season, but there's a new season for everyone here. Mm. And you know, when we, when, when everything happened, Levi with Amanda, we were, we had just gotten our legs under us as a church plant. So we were about 120 people at the time Mm. when she was killed. And so it was, it was a really difficult thing as we grew out of that, which was really interesting. I mean, we grew from about 120 to about 500 in six months of the aftermath of her death. Mm. Gosh. And so, you know, I would call that looking back on that, that's more of a dumb growth. There wasn't like leadership infrastructure in that. In the early days of church planting, you're discipling everybody. You're seeing everybody mm. come to know Christ. You're doing everybody's premarital counsel. You're doing. So, so here, all of a sudden we find ourselves with this church growing, but, the pastor is on some, on some level, very wounded, kind of limping along, trying to figure out how to heal from this while trying to right. lead them. People are stepping in. So it just, it became this situation that we realized over the next couple of years that it wasn't, it didn't have the solid infrastructure it needed to continue to give new life to be a missional, purposeful church outside of what had happened. Mm. Very, and, and to grow 400% somewhat yeah. overnight. Right. You know, meanwhile, you're, you're very much traumatized, like oh, you said, yeah. healing a in fi- shock. In, with Weston was like a year and a half or. Yeah, 15 months old. Little guy. So you're single dad and right. single yeah. pastor and. Okay, well, let's, let's peel back. I'm going to come back to that because that's yeah, another yeah. death. I mean, to have the church kind of, but which right. is you're saying the grace kind of not only shifted, but somewhat for the church itself lifted, mm. which exactly. is an interesting thought. You know, I've. Wow. I think it it is important as in, as leaders to know what to start, but it's also maybe equally important and more of a faith step at times to stop, you know, yeah. to do things, to stop doing yeah. things. And we do tend out of our pride sometimes to keep things going out of a sense of like, no way in my ego, I never say die as opposed to like, also, Hey, right. like it's run its course. And this, this right. is a new season. And like you're saying, like, Hey, we're going to kill this. And, and not that it, yeah. it doesn't mean what, what it did wasn't good. And, you know, it, it's a mercy in its own self to, to go, Hey, we didn't go into the pandemic and fizzle. We just, it had it a beginning, a right. middle and an ending. And yeah. I do want to talk more about that, but you know, as for those who are listening, who haven't heard your story, haven't gotten to understand, you've mentioned it a few times, but let's talk about that day in, in November and what happened to yeah. Amanda and yeah. and all that. I mean, you guys had been married how how many years at that point? We had been married seven. We just celebrated our seventh anniversary mm. in August of that year. And then on November 10th, I left really early in the morning to go to the gym um, and came back to shower after the gym and my home had been broken into. Now, I didn't realize it at the time. I just, as I walked through the front door, I saw Amanda lying on the living room floor and things disheveled all, all, uh, all over the room. And And she was surrounded by blood. But Mm. for me, what I thought, she had been having some dizzy spells during her pregnancy. We were 13 weeks along. And we had Wes, who was 15 months old. And I had thought that she had had a miscarriage. 
she had maybe gotten out of the shower, got dizzy, and then, you know, something happened to the baby. It's interesting, Levi, it's interesting when we're having this conversation. I got introduced to you guys in a sermon that you preached at Elevation Church, and it was a few weeks prior to this happening. Mm. So I'm listening in Chick-fil-A of all places. I'm listening to, I'm watching you preach. I've never, never seen you, but I'm watching you preach this and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is amazing the way this guy's walking through the tragedy that you guys mm. experienced with, with Linya. And so I go home to a man. I'm like, you got to, I'm start trying to recap the sermon and I'm like totally butchering. And I'm like, you just got to listen to it, right? You just got to. <laughs> so we, two weeks before she was killed, we went to Chicago on a romantic getaway and listen to your sermon. And we're just in tears together weeping. And she looked at me and she said this, she said, Davey, I feel like that God is leading us into a season of pain. Mm -hmm. She said, I, ca I can't put my thumb on it, but I just feel like, and she goes, maybe, maybe, maybe we're going to lose this baby and we need to be prepared for that. And maybe God's going to use it to help us as we're pastoring people who have gone through pain. She and I had both lived a very charmed life up to that point, both pastors, kids, both wonderful households, no like childhood trauma, anything like that, not dysfunctional. I mean, of course, not perfect, but like not dysfunctional households, just a lovely life. Mm -hmm. And so we understood, we had learned through leadership, we had learned through, but we hadn't learned, we didn't know pain. And so she had this inclination. And so that was lodged in my, in my heart in my head when I walk in that day and I see this. And so all I could think was, we just miscarried the baby, but get her to the hospital. She's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. And call the paramedics. They get her to the hospital. Those moments are so traumatic, right? You're mm -hmm. just, yeah. everything goes in fast motion, and slow motion at the same time. Felt like it took forever for the paramedics to get there. And it took three minutes and we get her to the hospital. I'm sitting in the waiting room. I have Weston on my knee and doctors and investigators come in and start questioning me. And I'm like, what is going on right now? Mm -hmm. Like, and they, when they realized I just didn't have a clue what had happened, they said, David, she has three bullet wounds. She's been shot three times. Mm -hmm. And um, what they, as they started piecing things together, they realized that the story comes out. Now we've had the, the trial and, you know, the, the actual sentencing and all of that. But there were three men that were on a random crime spree in our city, broke into the home three doors down from us, watched me leave for the gym that morning and decided to take that opportunity to come and break into our home. And, um, and, and that was the day my life got completely turned upside down. Yeah. 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 Wow. And thank was there motive? That. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. I know you've, you've, you've seen God use this story, Amanda's life, uh, yeah. touch people all around the world as it continues to. And that's the whole heartbeat of nothing is wasted. That's the heartbeat of pain to purpose. And and as well, you know, has been something that's so powerful. So I, I know you're comfortable and and yeah. willing to share, which yeah. is yeah. doesn't mean it ever gets any easier. But I do know enough to know that there comes a point where if you're healed, you actually are almost grateful. People are like, oh, I can't, I can't believe you would talk about it. You're like, man, it's yeah. it's a it's a yeah. joy, it's an honor, it's a you know, because yeah. she's um, it's part of the fruit to her account too. Is, right. is how God redeems through exactly. all of this, right? Exactly. But that's right. That doesn't ever get easier. Does you don't ever get you know numb numb to that? But um, right. The motive was burglary. What like what was? Yeah, completely burglary. You know, they were just trying to, you know, in their words, just hit a few houses, and you know they had broken into three, I believe, prior to ours, and that was it. And so, we th I think based on everything I've heard through the trial that. Uh, well, what I know happened is that they left one of the guys, Larry Taylor, with Amanda. They they stole our debit cards, the other two accomplices, and decided to go to the bank to try to get some money out of the bank account. Left him, and he's the most deranged of all of them. And um, I think that Amanda saw an opportunity. He wasn't a very big guy, but saw an opportunity to maybe wrestle the gun away from him or something. No doubt protecting Weston or trying to protect Weston. Mm. Um, maybe he threatened her or something. It's that, that part, because it was just him in the house, that part is fuzzy. We don't really know what happened. Um, cause there weren't any eyewitnesses, but what we're piecing together is we think that that that's what happened. He decided to, to shoot her at that point. Mm. And then he flees. Um, and then he flees. The other guys pick him up. And incidentally, then it was all of the phone calls that he was placing to these other guys 
that the investigators were able to use to ping him with cell phone tower technology and wow. text message stuff you know, that they recovered from his phone and everything to pinpoint him at the scene of the crime. And how long after do, do, you, do you think you arrived back to the house? Yeah, so I, the, he left around 6.45-ish and I arrived back at the house probably about 7.30. Mm. But I didn't walk into the house until about 8.10. So every Tuesday I would have a phone call with my best friend who's a pastor, a uh, church planter out in Delaware. And we would just talk every Tuesday morning. And so Amanda had asked me to take those phone calls and finish those before I come back into the house. For Weston's she sake. Was so, yeah. Because of Weston's sake. Because he would wake up every day at eight o'clock without fail. I mean, he was so routine. And she was, she's like, baby, my only time of quiet with Jesus is seven to eight. Totally. And there'd be times that I would walk in at like 730 or something, talk, chatting away with Kenneth, you know, loud, <laughs> not even realizing it. She's like, can you please just. <laughs> so it just. Wow. It's really interesting, guys, when you look at all of the different like even sitting through the trial and looking and going, there are so many things that if that had just been different, mm. this would have never happened. If that little tiny thing had changed, this would have, you look at the random string of events mm. and it really forced me to have to wrestle with, okay, is life just this random string of events that, that, ten, you know, that happened to us or is there, do I really believe what I've preached and, and said I believe my entire life that there is everything passes through the sovereign hands of a holy God. Yeah. And that he cares for us. He's a loving father. So every good gift comes from above, even if it doesn't seem like a good gift. Anything that comes into our life is from him and he's got good plans out of it. Now, does he cause this to happen? Evil to no, he can't cause evil to happen. That's the antithesis of his character and nature. Yeah. But he already has a plan to judo that evil that comes into our life and what the enemy means for evil to turn it around into good. And, um, and there are going to be a, so many why questions that I'll never know on this side of eternity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was that like for you to wrestle with those whys? Because I, I totally get that though, though, not even, maybe not even the whys, but like the, the hows and the what ifs yeah. and the yeah. if onlys and, you know, those kind of things. Like what did that look like for you? And obviously I, t I understand that it's a journey and it's a process and yeah, it's right. um, a lot of things, but maybe giving our listeners a little glimpse into what that process was for you. Your as napkin math on that. Yeah. 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 Well, I used to, I, I used to think, and I think being a pastor, it, it didn't set me up well for success in this. I used to think that I was, I wasn't supposed to ask why I wasn't supposed to question God, you mm -hmm. know, you're kind of just supposed to accept it. But what that means is you just shove it down, suppress it numb to it. There, those questions are there inevitably, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And anytime that we experience something that doesn't reconcile with whether it's the God, who we thought God to be or what he, we thought he was supposed to do for us, kind of the vending machine God that in Western American culture we tend to create or fabricate, it causes, that gap causes questions. And what can happen is what we're seeing now, a deconstruction taking place in people's faith all over. It's not that they, it's, it's that they're not given a space to go and ask those difficult questions. Because if we do approach the throne of grace with confidence in those difficult questions, God shows up. Yeah. And he may not give us explanation, but as Eliz Elizabeth Elliot says, he gives us something far greater. He gives us incarnation. Mm. He says, yeah. I am with you in Come this. On. And as, a, as human finite beings, we're not going to understand or fathom the full mind of God, right? We just don't, we don't get it. There, his ways are so much higher than our ways. And yet at the same time, he's going, but I'm here with you. And I'm the only religious figure, so to speak, that has entered into suffering willingly, subjected himself to suffering and walked through that suffering to show us one, how to walk through it, but also to so that we have a high priest that can empathize with us, that yeah. gets it, that understands what we're going through. So if nobody else understands in this world what we've experienced, he understands it. Yeah. He gets it. And so then because of that, as we ask those why questions, he invites us into 
deeper healing with that. So he reveals the character and nature, mysteries of who he is, not anything that's going to be extra biblical or outside of scripture, but like these fresh new insights, personal insights that the Holy Spirit ministers to you in. Yeah. That no person can tell you, no book, you can't get it from any book. You can't get it like he does that. As First Peter says, right? He himself restores, confirms, strengthens, and establishes your feet. And so that's, so I thought early on that I wasn't supposed to question God. It was interestingly enough, it was through the eyes of a lion. And wow. Levi, your text message, random text message a month afterwards is I'm, I've found myself physically sick on a couch not able to move because I had suppressed so much of this grief and these questions, not knowing what to do with them. Mm. And when, when I read in through the eyes of a lion, which by the way, I don't know if I ever shared this with you guys, but when we were on that train two weeks before Amanda passed away, I put through the eyes of a lion on reserve in the library and it didn't come available until three days after Amanda's death. You did tell me that. I remember that. Wow. And So so I'm, devouring it, giving it to all of my family members, reading, mm. and I'm going, oh my gosh. gosh. But you texted me and our conversation, you reminded me I needed to run toward the roar. Mm. And I knew what that meant because at the time I'd been running away from a few things. I'd been kind of, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to look at it. And there were two of them. One was, there was a song that would connect to my, from my phone to my Bluetooth in the car and it would play by default. You know, it's like the first one in your playlist that just comes up and it was a song that was played in our wedding. And so every time I'd get in the car, I would get so angry. Oh gosh. And I would just turn it off, you know, the dashboard, like just bang the dashboard. And I'm like, like, why, you know, why is this? And it was a trigger, you know, we call it, now we have terminology for that, right? Everybody calls it triggers of this trauma. And, and And I thought that trigger was a villain. And what I realized is that trigger was actually God inviting me into deeper healing. Gosh, that's so good. And so I knew I had to go and listen to that song intentionally. So I turned it up and I just wept. I mean, 45 minutes of just ugly cry. Mm. But what happened is all of that, not the physical, like my body keeping the score in that moment, it all just, it subsided because I was now weeping and bringing my pain to the Lord and asking him the really, really difficult questions. He can handle, he's not intimidated by that. He can handle And so I wasn't healed, but all of a sudden I felt like I had agency now. Like I didn't have to take it back on my heels and I could like, okay, I can, I can accept these invitations that God puts along the way and he's going to lead me into healing. And so the second thing, the second trigger for me or the thing I needed to run toward was going back into the house. And so, um, I chose a date three months after everything happened to go back into the house, start packing all of her stuff up. But I had to do the same thing. I met her family, my family. We all went, but I said, I need about an hour by myself to to do this. And so they just kind of let me have that hour. And I walked in and, um, and I just went to the place that I found her and laid down and just wept. And, and those are the kinds of things that I find now as we work with other people, I, I challenge them with that same, I say, hey, listen, find the thing that is terrifying you and actually decidedly go to that thing. Hmm. Because all of a sudden now you, there's something that lifts emotionally and in the spiritual too, because the enemy is trying to lord this over you to keep you captive. And now you find that that bondage is being broken. And so you're not haunted by that anymore. I right. still... I can still put myself in that moment. I can still think about it. I can st- it still can catch my breath a little bit, but I'm not haunted anymore. Davey, that's, wow, that's very gosh. strong. That's very helpful for so people. So helpful. To know that you can, in time, overturn the associations connected to the trigger. It'll still be yeah. there and there'll still be the ping, but now it, it pivots you into a new, you've like middle, meddled with it where it has a, a worship outcome and a strength that's outcome it. instead of a, a fear. Because you tend to think, oh, I just need to avoid my triggers. That's why we have trigger warnings. Avoid yeah. all, but you can't avoid, I mean, you could avoid a life of all those triggers, but where's, where's the power in that? Where's, where's the, the healing? healing in that? Yeah. 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 That's um, right. Did, to go back, you know, the, the doctors, you said the authorities came in. Did, was there ever a point when they were like thinking maybe this was something you were involved in before they, you know, of course found out the truth? Yeah. Well, and, and naturally so. I mean, the questions they were asking me at first, because I was in a position where I'm going, I don't, 
I don't understand what just happened. And all these, these questions come at me very invasively. Mm. You know? Cause I'm you like, assume she had a miscarriage. There's, they, they know she's, it's a yes. gunshot wound. Yeah. Yes. So we were on two totally different pages. So it didn't make sense at first, but then it hit me like, oh, okay. They're always going to suspect the husband, something that he has something to do with this. Yeah. So my, my approach was like, okay, just cooperate, just whatever it is they ask, just and give them straight answers. And of course I'm in this massive place of shock. Like I preparing for the trial, I had to go back and read the transcripts of what I, you know, answering those interrogations. There was about three rounds of those. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I read them. I'm like, I don't even recognize, I don't remember this at all. Wow. I don't even recognize my answers. Like, it's just amazing what kind of shock you're under in those situations. Um, but anyways, yeah, they, they did. And, and I, I understand it. But at the same time, they were extremely gracious about it too. They mm -hmm. continued, I looked, reading the transcript, they kept saying, I'm so sorry we have to ask you this understand under the circumstances this is really difficult for you but i need to ask you this wow. how long and did it take that to was, catch those guys yeah two weeks wow two weeks is how long they were at large yeah yeah when did they first get any 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 evidence that even put them on those guys track you, you said the cell phone tower was one piece yeah well what was crazy about it is there was no fingerprints left anywhere at any of the houses there were no there was no dna left at any of the houses what they had done is they had um, stolen a car and throughout their, you know, each stop, they were picking up different items and they found several of those items in this stolen car. And one of those items was a pink scarf that one of the guys had stolen to wrap around his face so that he wouldn't be recognized by like a ring camera. And on that pink scarf was a little bit of his DNA. God. And so they used that DNA to trace then all of the rest of the, that was kind of the breadcrumb first that they traced to find the rest of the guys. It's, it was crazy as when wild. you go. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you know, when you, when we watched how they put the case together, it was, first of all, I was like, wow, this is masterful. Like, you know, here I am seven years removed from it. We're in this trial for a whole week. We're in this emotional ups and downs. But for like the first two days, at least, I guess part of a jury trial or ours was a bench trial because they couldn't find a jury that was, un, that was untainted. It, we had been Everyone mistried knew multiple about it. times. Everybody yeah. knew about it. Yeah. Yeah. So they end up going to a bench trial, which is just the judge. But during that bench trial, you're, they have to present all the stuff they thought was evidence that they had admitted as evidence and if, whether it was relevant or not. So they kept, they started their case going like, well, we did this, did this, did this. And it was, it was irrelevant. And we're like, wait a minute, do they even have anything? So two days into it, our whole family's like, do we even have the right guy? Like, what is going on here? Mm. It was very unnerving. But then on the last day, ironically, it was the third day, right? Which I'm like, there it is, you know, the third day, of course, yeah. like the whole case came together brilliantly. And we were like, oh my gosh, that was the most masterful thing we've ever seen. You know, it would, it would beat anything you would watch on TV as far as court cases and stuff. Jeez. And forgive me for coming back. At which point in this process did she go to heaven? Because presumably when she's brought yeah. into the hospital, she's still alive. Yeah, presumably she was still alive. And so on November, so when I found her, she was breathing, but she was unconscious, but it was a very labored breathing. And so we, they, they ran tests for about 24 hours, 24 hours later, it came back that there was no brain activity. Mm. So somewhere in between November 10th, and November 11th, she went to heaven. Um, and we're not exactly sure when it was. So we just put November 11th as, as you know, that date. Yeah. I remember watching the funeral online mm -hmm. and watching, you know, so much of what was coming out of, you know, the ministry and you're, you're telling the story and carrying her legacy and, you know, honoring her. It just, it, it came across so clearly what a vivacious spirit, what a love for Jesus, what a love for, I mean, even what she's saying, like, I feel like God's preparing us for pain, like that, yeah. that revelation and that she didn't say that salty. She said that like, no. Yes, Lord, here yeah. am I, send me. I mean, right. it just seems like I'd love for yep. you just to talk about uh, Amanda's love for God, her life, her testimony yeah. for a moment. Yeah, I think what's beautiful is being able to go back and read her journals after the fact and seeing the genuine, you know, when you're writing, when you're journaling to the Lord, you're seeing the true nature of who you are, right? You're seeing what's actually going on in your heart. And 
that was when I fell more in love with her in that than I had ever had in her lifetime, just seeing how surrendered she was to the Lord, her genuine, yeah. pure love for the Lord. And everybody that knew Amanda, they would say that. There, there was, if you knew Amanda, you loved her because she just had this pure, genuine love for the Lord and love for people. Mm. And she wanted her entire life to be wrung out for the cause of Christ. I remember when we were 18, we read The Barbarian Way together. It was when, or She was 18, I was 20. We had just started dating, but we, we read The Barbarian Way together and she started wrestling through this idea of, you know, this barbarian way, this idea of John the Baptist, the story didn't turn out the way that she, that he thought it was going to turn out, but am I going to follow after the Lord no matter if it turns out the way I think it's going to turn out? And it was in that wrestling that you can see in her journal entries, she begins to decidedly say, Lord, whatever it is you're calling me to, whatever it is, our relationship was so young, so she wasn't using us language anymore. <laughs> we had just started dating, but whatever it is you're calling me to, and if it is this, and if it's I, my life is yours. Mm. And it was the case all the way up until the last morning that she was alive. So that Monday morning, that was a Tuesday, November 10th when I came in, but Monday morning, I remember going in back into the bedroom where she was doing her quiet time. And I had just kind of finished my quiet time that Monday. It was a Monday, right? So, you know, the, you guys just said it. Mondays, past, you're just like in two this thumbs, fog. Two thumbs down on post Mondays. You're like, yeah. I, don't, I just want to quit ministry. And so it was a little bit later. And you know and what? Let me pause finished. and say, that's whether the sermon goes well or bad. That's right. Because if it goes bad, you're like, I'm in the wrong line of work. If it goes well, you're like, I can never do that again. You know, that's so it's, right. both, it's both ways. Uh. And I walk in and she wasn't in her normal place sitting on the bed. And I was like, where did she, what? And so I look in the bathroom and then I look back over and she's kneeling, kneeling at the bed. And that was not a, I had not seen her do that very often, but there was this, there was something decidedly different about her posture and her tenor that morning. Wow. Where I was just like, man, God, like looking, I can only know looking back on it, right? Yeah. In retrospect, like God was doing something in her heart and her, if you could summarize her life, you would say she was steadfast and surrendered. Mm. That's what you would say. What an amazing girl. Mm. I, I, I just am struck by the thought that she even said, hey, finish your phone call in the front yard or backyard or your car because I'm meeting with Jesus. <laughs> and, That's right. And here, it was you sacred. know, and it's kind of the moment you're in of like, hey, do your thing, Davey, run your race, love Weston, serve Weston. Wow. I'm, I'm with Jesus, mm. you know? And, wow. And, um, Wow. It also is not lost on me that you just quoted from Elizabeth Elliot, mm -hmm. who had a husband go home to be with Jesus yeah. and then continued yeah. serving and ministering and ended up remarrying and walking a redemption story out. When in a, in a lot, I mean, in, in many ways, that's, that's, that's been, that's not the cup you asked for. Yeah. It's, right. you would say like, Jesus, I don't want this cup, but I'm willing to drink the cup the father gives me in the sense that. Yeah. You know, you now get to carry on and are living a, a, a brand new story, of course, you and Christy and, and, and the blended family, but also at the same time are honoring this legacy of this beautiful yeah. life of Amanda, who's with Jesus. And, you know, yeah. and that's, that's not a betrayal, of course, one or the other, right? Right. But that, right. Not at that, all. I right. just, I just, I'm struck by, I think we are all in awe of what someone else can carry that we don't. You know, because we go, I, I could never do that. But to hear, you know, yeah. you talk about that, it, it is really um, a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, a couple of things to that, Levi, you know, people say that a lot. Like, I, I hear that a lot. Well, I mean, I've not gone through the pain that you've gone through. I don't know how I could do, I would never be able to respond the way. And I, I just push back and go, listen, do you have the Holy Spirit? Because if you have the Holy Spirit, he is going to equip you. He's giving you everything yeah. you need for life and godliness. That's right. And it says for life and godliness, that means living a godly life, no matter what plight your life takes, no matter mm -hmm. what cup is given to you, the Holy Spirit has equipped you to do that. So he's, a, he's, a, he's equipped me to carry this. He's equipped you to carry what he's called you to carry. And so to, be, to compare or try to project or put yourself in someone else's shoes is like really futile, right? But I yeah. want that to encourage people to, to say, you don't have to be afraid. Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble. Take heart. I've overcome. I've I've overcome the world is what he says. And I've told you this so that you can have peace. Yeah. Yeah. And so whatever we go through, we know the Lord is going to carry us through that because he's called us to it. And, and so that's, you know, the other thing too is, you know, 
it's it's a really um it's it's such an amazing thing now to watch how God threads redemption in your story as well and how he uses all of those pieces you know I never I didn't know if I was going to have a meaningful marriage again I didn't know what that was going to if that you know couldn't imagine falling in love with someone again right and then you see that God grows your capacity for love just yeah. like he does with your kids and you see this beautiful it, it's interesting because Amanda ran cross country my wife now ran cross country in college and also ran the four by 400. And so we always think of it as like passing the baton. Yeah. Mm. Wow. And so when I was kind of started to feel like God was healing me enough to even kind of poke my head up a little bit and go, if you would bring me another wife, if I could have another meaningful marriage, Lord, you know, I don't know what that looks like, but I would want her to love you more than she loves me, Jesus. Because that's the most important thing. I would, I want her to love me because I'd be nice too. I would want her to love <laughs> Weston as if he is her own. And right. I, I'd want her to love Amanda mm. because I knew that this would be so much a part of what I was going to be carrying for you know the rest of my life, part of our ministry. Well, interestingly enough, uh, you know, I won't get into all the details of how I first met Christy and noticed her. But one of the things I, that made me know that she was the one that God was was that had for me in this next season was that she informed me in one of our first conversations. She had, by the way, zero interest in me, did not want to have anything to do with me, um, <laughs> was attending the church I was pastoring. And I was so intrigued by her. And I kept kind of like really uh, as as uncreepy as I possibly could, trying to like get around, <laughs> totally. get around her in conversation. You know, like standing at certain places in the atrium after the sermon while she, you know, and, <laughs> but she's avoiding me like the plague, mm-hmm. you know. But then I finally, I always say I corner her very pastorally at one point, <laughs> and I ask her, you know, about herself. Hey, you don't, I, I don't know you. You've been coming to my church for a while. What's your Jesus story? Because I guess that's how pastors date when they're trying to figure out, you know, it's your Jesus story. <laughs> And um, she tells me some of her story and then she was serving in our inner city ministry that we had started because of how Amanda was killed to interrupt and intercept crime, drug related activity and kids and teenagers before they step into that. So we're doing this inner city and I ask her this, I'm like, and she goes, well, I'm interested, you know, she tells me about missions work that she had done. And so I'm like, oh, okay, that's why you're serving in our inner city ministry. She said, well, actually my stepdad and my mom live in that neighborhood that you guys serve. And I'm like, man, that's a really like high crime neighborhood. That's dangerous. Like, they do that on purpose. She said, yeah, that's part of what they feel like their ministry is. In fact, you know, and I said, well, the reason we started that is because Amanda and how she, she goes, yeah, I know your story and I'm more familiar with it than you're probably would be comfortable with. And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? She said, my stepdad who lives in that neighborhood is also one of the chaplains for the, Marion County prison system. And he's been assigned to the three guys that killed your wife. Hmm. Wow. Wow. So sir, he shares the gospel. Needs. Yeah. Yes. He shares the gospel with them every week. So you mentioned Elizabeth Gosh. Elliot and I've sensed this like Elizabeth Elliot, Jim Elliot kind of calling on our life that not only are we supposed to walk this thing out and walk out the redemption that God has for us by helping other people in their pain, but also even maybe step right back into and offering forgiveness to the very people that perpetrated in the first place. Wow, Davey. And wow. I mean, you at the trial were no doubt face to face with them. Yeah. Yeah. It was the first, the trial was the first time I was face to face with the shooter, Larry Taylor. Mm. And uh, up to that point, we'd been in a couple of hearings with the other two accomplices. The other two accomplices, they took plea agreements to testify against the shooter to help substantiate the case. So their sentences were lessened while Larry was the one that was um, essentially, I mean, he got 84 years plus another 30 years for another, you know, um, mm. another thing that he had done. So he, he won't, you know, he'll be in prison for the rest of his life. And what but, about the other two? The other two, one of them got 29 years and uh, the other one was right about 20 years. Okay. And what, I can't even imagine what that was like for you, yeah. for Amanda's family, for everybody seeing Ugh. him in that courtroom. What? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole lot that I have to say about that. <laughs> um, sure. I actually was on our podcast and I talked about it for about an hour because it was just processing through all of the, 
different emotions about that, seeing him for the first time. And you know, I always wrestle with like, okay, I know what I'm supposed to, how I'm supposed to approach this because, you know, we're all going to run into these situations where life is going to confront us with something that's going to say, do you really believe what you say you believe? And I had preached messages on forgiveness and all the way up to the the point of losing Amanda. But then I'm like, wait, do I really believe this? Like, do I really believe that forgiveness when I step into the battle and the spiritual, that forgiveness is actually letting God be the avenger in this, letting him take care of this and trusting him with that. And, and if, and when I do that, then it actually, it actually undermines what the enemy is trying to do in the first place. When I don't fight the battle of the, that's supposed to be in the spiritual with flesh, when I don't fight fire with fire, bitterness with bitterness, but instead fight it with forgiveness, weapons of righteousness, do I really believe that that's what's going to partner with God to undermine all of what's happened? Do I really believe that? Because when I'm staring at him face to face, I don't want to believe that. And so right. it, was a, it was a huge battle, but it's really amazing what happens. And this is to encourage everybody who's listening to this. When you do step into it, whether you feel it or not, you watch God move powerfully. Gosh, yes. Yes. And there was something spirit that broke in that room when I read to each three of these guys different statements that told them, I've chosen not to hold this against you. I forgive you. And then shared the gospel with them. Gosh. Davey, that's, that's beautiful. Wow. Mm. Well, and we'll point our listeners to that podcast. Yeah, so the podcast so, is called the Nothing is Wasted podcast. Yeah. So easy to find. That's on all the platforms, I imagine. All the platforms, yeah. And YouTube then, well. and this is very exciting because it's finally, because of the trial, able to be released. Yep. I know you've been praying for a very long time about the yep. release of a book. And that is uh, right now able to be pre-released, uh, purchased pre-ordered. for pre-order. Yeah. Uh, and that's called the Nothing is Wasted book. Yeah. That's right. Congratulations, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And Levi, Praise you were God. kind enough to write the forward to that. So thank you I so much. I was very bro. pleased to do that. And I'm just glad it's seen the light of the of day now. And I love yeah. the connections. Yeah. And I I knew there was the connection. Um, you've told me the story before of of the 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 train ride and the getaway to Chicago yeah. and the God using our book. And it's really just a, like like what you're doing is and is the same thing as that we've done is that we receive comfort, we give it, we receive it, we give that's it. Right. And yeah. that's how yeah. we heal. Yeah. So yeah. it was an honor for me to do that. I am so glad it's now with the trial behind you able to come out. So I would love, I know every, every Lusketeer listening is like, man, this is, this is powerful. Yeah. Um, go pre-order it. Those do matter, the pre-orders, because it tells Amazon and Barnes yeah. and Noble and all the places how many books to order for them. So when they get a, a good amount of pre-orders coming, it gets them, you know, ordering more because the worst thing is everyone goes, oh, I'll just wait to buy it until it's out. Then they don't order a ton and then it comes out and everyone buys it and it says out of stock. So, mm. you know, any pre-order is helpful to the lar- right. large, it tells the, the it tells them, hey, print ample. And this yeah. would be a great book for someone who's gone through something horrible. I mean, obviously we've talked about a lot, triggers, exposure therapy, uh, you know, forgiveness, so many different levels of healing and, you know, not deconstruction, but instead constructing a, a robust theology that can handle right. the weight of suffering. Good. Um, right. And it, it would be powerful to get the podcast, uh, the book, um, obviously any pastor or church leader listening who's looking for some curriculum. You have the the pain to power curriculum. To Is that purpose. a book, a handbook? What pain to purpose? Sorry. Yeah, pain to purpose. Yeah. 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 It's a video curriculum where there's a guidebook as well. You know, so your participants go through and take notes on the video curriculum. But it can be done in small groups. Um, our team trains. You know, we will come and cha- train your church. Uh, lay. It's designed for lay leadership. Love so that it. way, the weight of this kind of stuff isn't put on the pastor. And so you have lay, you have members in your congregation who have also gone through something difficult and are looking for ways to partner with God in the redemption journey of yes, that yes. by helping other people. And so we help you identify those people, train those people to facilitate those conversations, use the video curriculum. And we're seeing some powerful things happen through that. Wow. Beautiful. And obviously then churches can book you to come out and speak. Where's the information for all things this? Yeah. All things, nothing is wasted.com. Very easy. If you specifically the book, you can go to nothing is wasted book.com. 
Um, but yeah, nothing is wasted.com. Everything you'll be able to find anything from pain to purpose, the coaching that we have, if you're looking for one-on-one -on -one coaching, what's really cool about our coaching is that we match up people based on pain points. Mm. So if I can't, you know, I can't understand what someone is going through sexual betrayal, for instance, what they're experiencing, but we have coaches who have, that's their story. They've been certified through our process, they're trauma informed, and they're able to coach you one-on-one -on -one through that. And it's all biblically centered, spirit filled, trauma informed. Um, the entire process. Very Gosh, good. Incredible. All right. Well, we will have you back again. Um, we would love to talk more about what God's doing in your life right now. Obviously, He's using yeah. this, but even just more of your story with Christy and your kids and blended family. Yeah, there's a lot more stuff. we can talk about. This was <laughs> so, just a lot there. <laughs> out the gate from the beginning. We got to we got to cover a lot of ground yeah. there. Davey, it was a joy. Uh, you have the most pirate sounding name of anybody we've ever had on the podcast. <laughs> Davey Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> have you been told that before? Oh, geez. I know I've never actually been told that before. So that's Are one you of those serious? Glass you remember like in How I Met Your Mother, the glass shattering moment, you know, that's like, <laughs> oh no, I can't unsee it now. <laughs> well, we have this thing in our You've family never where been every told that? every kid never has what would so if you funny. were a pirate, what would your pirate name be? There Olivia of the Seven Seas, you know, dangerous Daisy. <laughs> Davy, we're not changing yours at all. Nope. Uh, when you come over Davey for pirate Black. night at our house, it's just gonna be <laughs> Davy Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I love that. But it's I not that's that. not a knock because pirates piracy is awesome. Hey, you know. Listen, that's right. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm just thinking like Martian, you know, Matt Damon, when he's like, technically, oh, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a loon, I'm a, I'm a Martian pirate. You know? <laughs> yeah. He commandeered a vessel. Okay, Davey, uh, thank you. Awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank Praise you God for the redemption in your story. Thanks for opening up about it. We will have you back and talk uh, more things, new things, uh, different things, and better things. And, and, and we hope everyone will get the book. And uh, thanks a lot for, yeah. for putting it out there. We love you. Yeah, Grateful you. for you. Thank you. Love you guys. It's been an honor. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to swing by levilusco.com and jennylusco.com to see what's going on in our world. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And in the meantime, we would love to connect with you on social media. Jenny, Jenny and Levi, Levi Lusco, Lusco out. out. Access more.